Hi everyone, the topic for today's module is that of canine lungworm. So when we discuss lungworm, there are a number of different types of lungworm that are included in that. The one we're mainly going to be uh, concerned with today is that of angiostrongus, which has become an emerging pathogen in the UK over the last five to 10 years. Um, and um, angiostrongus is sometimes known as the French heartworm. But we should also consider things like Oslerus osleri, Crenosoma vulpris. Crenosoma vulpris is the fox lungworm, but will affect dogs. And although this is a canine uh, medicine course, just for completeness, uh, we'll mention Aelostrongus abstrusus, which is the cat lungworm. So if we're focusing mainly on angiostrongus. Um, as I've said, it's a lungworm. It's a metastronglid, so it's considered to be a roundworm. And it's fairly endemic in the southeast of England and South Wales, but has also been reported throughout the UK, including as far north as Scotland and also in Ireland. The snail or slug is the intermediate host for this pathogen, and the dogs become infected by eating the L3 larvae in the intermediate host. And the adult worms then live in the pulmonary artery. So here on your, um, on your screen, you can see a, a pictorial representation of the life cycle of Angiostrongus vasorum. Um, so on the picture here, we can see the dog in the center. We've got the, uh, the snails and slugs, which uh, ingest the L1. Uh, we then have uh, the, uh, the, the L1 progressing through to L3, and the L3 is then ingested by the dog. And then the L3 matures um, uh, to adulthood um, in, in the, uh, the lungs of the dog. And the cycle continues as the dog sheds um, uh, eggs, and uh, these are um, effectively uh, eaten again by the slugs or snails in, in the, uh, the feces. So the L3 are released um, after ingestion of the slug or snail into the intestine of the dog, and then they migrate to the pulmonary vasculature. Um, they then uh, mature to adults and lay eggs, the adults living in the bronchi. The larvae then move up the trachea to the mouth where they are um, coughed up and swallowed. Um, and then they are passed in feces and ingested by snails and slug, and the cycle continues. Signalman, any um, dog can be affected, but typically it's more prevalent uh, or find more commonly in young dogs, less than two years. This may be because they're more curious, more likely to eat things externally, more likely to pick up snug slugs or snails in the garden, perhaps. But there's also a higher prevalence in Staffordshire Bull Terriers and Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, and this may be due to a defect in local immunity, so higher risk in these breeds. Perhaps also higher risk in greyhounds, but that may be because they're often housed together in close contact and there's, there's greater chance of, of uh, transmission. And it's found in both urban and suburban dogs. Clinical signs are very variable. Uh, the ones we're most familiar with are cardiorespiratory signs, but many other different types of, of symptoms have been reported, including coagulopathic and neurological signs. So we'll cover each of those in turn. So cardiorespiratory signs, first of all, the larvae stimulate an intense inflammatory response in the pulmonary tissue. And this gives us the typical respiratory signs we're used to seeing. So coughing, perhaps dyspnea, syncope as a result, perhaps even hemoptysis, tachypnea, exercise tolerance, even ascites or pulmonary hypertension. So these symptoms can be very severe and, and fatalities do occur. So it's not a, a syndrome to be taken lightly. As far as coagulopathic signs are concerned, various different types of um, bleeding syndromes have been reported, everything from hemothorax to cutaneous hemorrhages, some subconjunctival hemorrhages, retroperitoneal or abdominal hemorrhages, or even oral or gastrointestinal. It's thought that the coagulopathy in, with angiostrongus is a consumptive coagulopathy, so it's kind of a chronic form of DIC, but the process is poorly understood and we really don't know whether it's affecting uh, primary or secondary pathways, so there's still work being done on that. And the weird thing about the coagulopathy is not all cases have prolongation of clotting times, even though they have signs of um, coagulopathic changes, so a very strange disease. And neurological signs, um, this may be due to hemorrhage into the central nervous system or possibly also associated with aberrant larval migration. But we have had reports of dogs having paresis or paralysis of their hind legs, uh, hypermetria, um, or other neurological symptoms such as ataxia, circling, or even seizures. Uh, in addition, depression, nystagmus, or strabismus. So lots of different ways this, this condition can present. So we need to be open-minded to the presentation and be aware that due to 
it being present throughout the UK, this always has to be considered in an animal presenting with either cardiorespiratory, neurological or coagulopathic signs. So when we uh, take bloods from these dogs, we will typically find uh, a level of anemia. I guess the level of anemia will be dependent on whether there's concurrent bleeding or not associated with the coagulopathy. Um, they often have a thrombocytopenia, is an aphilia, and when we measure coagulation times, they may have prolongation of both prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time, but not all dogs with bleeding signs will have prolonged coagulation. So um, normal coagulation times do not, do not rule out angiostrongolus as a possible cause for your bleeding. And uh, on occasion, uh, some weird and wonderful changes such as hypercalcemia have even been reported with angiostrongolus, although the reason, reason for that isn't fully understood. So it's likely we'll take some thoracic radiographs as these animals will typically pre present with uh, respiratory signs. And typically we'll get a bronchointerstitial pattern with a dorsocaudal distribution. And we may also get right-sided cardiac enlargement. So I'll just show you a close-up of those radiographs you can see on the right-hand side of your screen. And hopefully in this one, it's a little bit more obvious than on the last slide that we've got this um, uh, patchy distribution, which is mainly uh, in the coda dorsal lung fields here. You can see it on both sides on the dorsal ventral view. And it's more um, obvious on the, the uh, caudal lung fields on the lateral view there as well. 